I mean, it, you know, it'd be disastrous. We're now talking about 25% of our diesel, if Corriton closes, being imported from foreign countries. That's a dangerous place to be. It's not only important for Canvey Island, this project, it's important for the whole country. Um, Stephen Metcalf, the Greek government, I'm told, um, stepped in with Olympic Airways back in 2003. Eventually, they were fined just 2 million euros. Are you saying that our government should actually break the law effectively and, and suffer the consequences later? Well, I'm not encouraging the government to break the law, obviously. What I'm asking them to do is look creatively at what further support they can give to the refinery. I don't think state ownership is an option. We're talking about to do that, to bring it into uh, public ownership would be a billion pounds. That's not to buy the refinery, that's to operate the thing because of the, the throughput of crude that goes through it and the storage of fuel. But there must be a way we can find of helping a buyer come forward and operate a refinery. Calvin Hopkins, would the Labour government, would a Labour government have broken these European rules? Well, if I had my way, I would certainly break those rules. I mean, other countries have broken the rules. Uh, it, it's ridiculous that you know we have uh, rules made in the European Union which some countries feel free to flout. Uh, and we seem to go, go along. We're a very law-abiding country. Um, I think perhaps we ought to look at changing those laws as well. Stephen Metcalf, what would the impact be, in your opinion, on the local economy if these 850 jobs <coughs> were lost? Well, I mean, obviously there's going to be a huge impact, uh, both locally and regionally. It's a, it's a regional employer. It has a lot of suppliers across the southeast of England and actually across the country. So the impact of its closure will be felt not just in Thurrock. But of course, locally, we have had a refining history, a refining tradition. It's part of our industrial heritage. There used to be three refineries, now there's one. And I think it would be a tragedy if it were to close. And as I said, I am trying to do everything I can to keep okay, it open. Okay, we'll leave it there. Bob Lizard, thanks for your time today. I'd like to we'll come back to you shortly. Now, to the way we run our police forces. There have always been bodies overseeing the work of the police, from justices of the peace to watch committees. But it's been the work of police authorities since 1964. Well, now they're to be replaced by a single police commissioner for each force that you will elect in five months' time. As Andrew Sinclair reports, the first candidates are now being selected. <laughs> These are the people who Labour hope will soon be the region's police and crime commissioners. One for every county, many of them former local councillors, but all stressing that if elected, they'll be staunchly independent. My track record always says that I um, stand up for the people who I represented and I'll stand up for Norfolk first. And what I want people to see me as is Norfolk-minded, um, rather than um, particularly Labour or independent minded. So we're looking for local solutions, but in that context of bringing Labour values in. This is a new idea, one person to be the face of policing in a county, responsible for policy, not day-to-day -day operations, and answerable to the electorate. But the biggest challenge at the moment is to sell the idea to voters. What's the matter with the system that they've got at the moment? Why should I get more money wasted? So it's already sort of set up like that anyway. I don't think that needs to be changed. The police minister in Northamptonshire this week tried to do his bit. Everybody will have their say, the ability to influence local policing priorities. It will put the public in the driving seat. It will help the fight against crime and it will strengthen the bridge between the police and the public. Labour have all their team in place. The Lib Dems are still deciding if they'll even take part. The Conservatives so far have just selected two candidates. This is their one for Northamptonshire, very enthusiastic about the new post. It's the best opportunity to do new things. So I'm not having to step into anyone else's footsteps, uh, do anything anyone else's way. I can develop this, design it, make it what I will. The wild card in these elections could be the independent candidates, local people who feel strongly about policing, like this businessman in Norfolk. I've lost £250,000 in theft this year alone, and I would say that um, in the last 40 years since I've been in business, I've lost over a million pounds. And I can tell you now, nobody's ever been caught or convicted for any of those crimes. The candidates are enthusiastic. Now they need to win over the public. So, Kelvin Hopkins, the Labour Party seems to have embraced the, this idea. Have you? Well, we've embraced the idea. We, we, this, the legislation's gone through uh, and we've got our candidates, splendid candidates, as you've seen. I was there too, uh, to, now in place. Um, I think the main thing is to, is to try to protect 
uh, protect the country and protect our region against the effect of police cuts. I'm getting a, a very negative vibe from you on this. Does it mean that you're grudgingly accepting what's already been decided? Well, I think nationally we, we, we put a case, an, an alternative case, but uh, now we have police commissioners, we're going to go for it uh, very strongly and do our best to protect the public given that we're going to have savage police cuts, uh, which, are, which are already affecting us now. Come back to you in a moment. Stephen Metcalf, in times of author austerity, I beg your pardon, why spend more than £100 million on, on electing these people? Well, I think this is about closing the, the, the democratic deficit. Um, I don't think it can be a bad idea to have someone who is in charge of policing at a local level, someone who is directly accountable uh, to the people that they serve, and this is what this is about. Now, I'm hoping that the costs of uh, electing police commissioners, whatever that turns out to be, will be more than covered by the Commissioner's ability to cut bureaucracy, to actually get our policemen out of the police stations and back onto the streets but who's to gonna drive police some efficiency. But who's going to police the Commissioners though? Well, the community, who, who polices any elected representative, that's what they are. They put themselves forward, they, they say what they're going to do, they then hopefully do it, and then they are held to account by the public that they serve. Calvin Hopkins, what's your view on that idea? For example, in America, I know it's, it's not here in the UK, but there have been several cases of, of corruption. Well, I mean, I'm, <clears throat> I'm sure it won't be the case with our splendid candidates, particularly in Bedfordshire, in Bedfordshire Ollie Martins, who's just, just a, fund, a, a brilliant guy and a personal friend, and I'm sure he'll do a superb job for, for Bedfordshire. But is so there I too much ha power, potentially, in the hands of one person, do you think? Well, we'll have to wait and see. I don't think so, personally. I think, we, presumably, we get the right candidates, and I think we have got the right candidates, certainly in, in the East, for, for my party, uh, and whoever wins, I, I hope, will do a... Uh, the best job possible and try to protect the public from the savage police cuts that are coming through. Um, this whole model of police commissioners was supposed to run in tandem with elected mayors but um, they've mm. been rejected at major referenda in, in several cities. Um, so again who is going to oversee? You mentioned uh, Stephen Metcalf the public will oversee but once somebody's been appointed how can they do that? Well they hold them to account at elections in the same way that we are both held to account mm. at elections. Mm. Um, there will be, of course, you know, checks and balances. Ultimately, there'll still be the, the Home Office who will, you know, call them to account if things are going wrong. There'll be the local panels that they will work in conjunction with. Um, but I, I don't. I see this as, you know. A real step forward. This is about democracy. It's about transparency, and it's about accountability. Mm -hmm. And it's through those things that we can manage the police budget. We spend a lot of money on policing. We can manage it better. Okay. We can do better. For the moment, thank you. Well, now it's time for our weekly political roundup with Deborah McGurran, when one of the usual suspects has a bone to pick with the coalition. All in 60 seconds. It's been a week of complaints kicked off by the local MP objecting to Boris Johnson's suggestion of a second runway at Stansted. This wild idea that the problems in the short term are solved by a second runway at Stansted. They're simply not. It goes against the very concept of a hub airport which the mayor himself is promoting. Another one of the region's MPs is cross that more and more farm workers are being exploited by unscrupulous gang masters. The complaints of striking doctors that they're being made to pay more and wait longer for their pensions cut no ice with Suffolk MP Dr Dan Poulter. I think it's unconscionable for doctors to strike anyway, but particularly when there's such a good deal on the table. While the MP for Wellingborough wants to part company from the coalition altogether. Would my preferred Deputy Prime Minister <laughs> arrange a divorce from the yellow peril? I think actually, on my own, if I bring up a sort of divorce, may be deeply troubling to Mrs. Bone. <laughs> Let's talk about the uh, industrial action by the, the doctors. Stephen Metcalf, did you support the action? No, I didn't. Um, I think uh, I understand that no one likes to have uh, their pension arrangements changed, but I think that uh, for doctors to have gone on strike uh, is the wrong move. But they is, it, it, fair, is it fair that they're paying effectively a higher percentage than other civil servants on the same salary? They will, after these changes, they will have the best possible publicly funded pension imaginable and that has to be paid for and to be paid for through additional contributions so I think they should focus on their patients and I'm very pleased Kelvin, to say that I in the East a lot Kelvin did. Hopkins in. so I don't want to have a pop at doctors a lot didn't strike. Kelvin Hopkins did you support the action? Well I, I think it's for the doctors to, to, to say what to, to, to support their action. I, um, they were obviously extremely angry 
And I think many doctors who didn't take strike action felt equally angry, but felt they couldn't actually, on that particular day, uh, take the action with their, with, with, their, with their fellow striking doctors. So I think even those who didn't, who went to work, felt very unhappy about the situation, and, and, and I think they still Thank do. You. Thank you both very much for your time today. Thank you. Well, that's all for now. You can keep in touch via our website, where you'll also find links to Deborah McGurran's blog for all the latest updates. We're back at the usual time of midday next week. I'll see you then. Back to Andrew.